Okay, again, my name is Pedro Hernandez. I'm the Senior Policy Coordinator at Fairvote. Um, I'm going to be joined by two guests, um, Ruth Greenwood uh, and George Chung. Um, Ruth will be joining us remotely. Um, Ruth Greenwood is the co-director of voting rights and redistricting for the Campaign Legal Center. Ruth is also a lecturer at Harvard Law School, uh, where she litigated uh, two partisan gerrymandering cases from the trial level to the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, that's Whitford v. Gill and Legal Women Voters of North Carolina versus Rucho, um, and has advised dozens of states on how to draft and implement independent redistricting commissions. Uh, George Chung is Director of More Equitable Democracy, an intermediary focused on engaging communities of color and young people in electoral systems reform. Uh, prior to this, he served as the Program Director for the Joyce Foundation's Democracy Program and co-chair of the Funders Committee for Civic Participation. Both our guests have been at the forefront of their uh, respective areas of work, voting rights and community engagement. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like for each of you to introduce yourself, but I'd like to start with a prompt. Um, in 1998, Lonnie Guarnier wrote in her book, Lift Every Voice, that the real value in exploring alternative election systems uh, is that engaging with and trying to remedy the experience of racial underrepresentation can provide useful lessons about democracy for all groups. When we look specifically at district-based winner-take-all elections for representation and collective decision-making bodies, access for minority voters is a problem to be sure. But access for all voters is also a problem, especially for anyone because of the accidents of geography cannot vote for the candidate they feel best represents their interests. Could you tell me about your work and how you see your work within the framework for improving American democracy? Um, I'll let Ruth go first. Okay, hello, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> yes, yes. Excellent. Well, I'm gonna share my screen so I can put my um, PowerPoint slides up, but I'm gonna have to look at this delightful view. <laughs> um, here we go. Are you seeing my screen or not yet? No, no, not yet. Not yet. Oh, okay, I thought it was. Ooh, I have to come out and then start again. Here we are. I'll, you know what? You don't need to see them. I will tell you. I will just talk to you. Um, <laughs> so um, the I wanted to just give you a brief introduction to why I care about ranked choice voting. Um, and it was uh, very apt that uh, Pedro earlier talked about Rep. Bayer's comment. Um, that we don't just have to do things the way we always have done them. Um, I grew up in Australia, as you may be able to tell from my accent, and I grew up with ranked choice voting, <laughs> so I think we should do it the way I've always done it. <laughs> um, uh, I came to America, and um, it's again to under understand more fully, you know, why the first part, the first system wasn't working, and it wasn't so weird for me uh, to to imagine a different system. Um, and then the other reason that um, I Choice voting in America in particular is um, Lonnie Guinea, who Pedro just mentioned. Um, I wrote her book, The Tyranny of the Majority, many years ago, and it just made a lot of sense. Um, I think it's interesting um, the, the quote from 1998 is from after when her book came out in 92. Um, but the, this question of accidents of geography, you know, we do in America care about where having a representative near where we live, right? We can't just abandon that and and a move to a PR system. There has to be some new rational basis. And I find this when I go out in communities and talk to people, people like that. Um, but the challenge is to try to do something where you get that sense of somebody you know, near me who's like me and is representing me, um, but without all of the uh, shenanigans being able to be played. Um, so uh, a while ago, when I used to live in Chicago, um, but when I was in Chicago, I started um, investigating um, the options of ranked choice voting, and uh, fortuitously, George Chung um, was in Chicago at the same time too, so we kind of egged each other on. Um, and I essentially worked out that there were lots of problems um, with respect to minority representation in eastern Illinois. So like many northern um, cities, Chicago um, has still a fairly segregated uh, community, so it has black and white 
like most you know um, and Asian areas within the city, but the suburbs are getting more integrated with a few are seeing growing um, populations from all the various communities, um, and that actually mirrors what's happening down in places like Los Angeles and Dallas and Phoenix, where you have much more integrated communities. Anyway, so we see this happening, um, and that is a problem if you're like me, are a Voting Rights Act litigator, um, because if you want to litigate under the Voting Rights Act, you need to be able to show that there is a um, sufficiently large and geographically compact community uh, that can have a district formed around them to get representation. Um, and so if you have an integrated community, as well as the disenfranchised movement, um, then you can't get representation through the Voting Rights Act. But you know what would help? Uh, ranked choice voting with multi-member districts. Um, and so I started trying to work on that with different communities uh, in Illinois. Um, and then <laughs> Joe moved to Washington, and so I continued working with him um, from coast to coast. Um, uh, I was going to, to show you, but I'm sure that you can imagine, um, the county of Yakima, a place where we recently sent a notice under the Washington Voting Rights Act. Um, the point there is that the Latino community is sufficiently integrated um, with the, the white and Native American communities that you can draw one district that would enfranchise the Latino community, one out of three for their county commission. But if you draw that district, I, I drew up one, um, that you are excluding 37% of the citizen voting age population that are Latino in the county of Yakima. And you're actually excluding 48% of the Latino population as a whole if you have that one separate district. Um, and so that means that even though you might be electing a candidate of choice, um, in that case of the Latino community, it's only the Latino community that are lucky enough to be put into that one district. Um, but if you were to use ranked choice voting, something like the Fair Representation Act, um, then you would be able to get a consensus candidate. Now that's obviously the local level. Um, we talked about how, in some ways, it, it, we think that getting ranked choice voting used at a local and state level might be helpful to eventually getting it at the federal level. Um, but you can imagine if you were to institute it at the federal level, then we could suddenly improve minority representation effectively overnight. Um, the, the next uh, chart that I wanted to show you, and again, I'm sure you can imagine this, is basically what did the population of America look like. Um, it is um, still majority white, but not that much of a majority white. Um, there are the largest minority population are Latinos, and then um, African Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans. But if you look at Congress, it's basically 75% um, so it, it is not necessarily the case that racial groups and ethnic groups have to choose candidates of their same race or ethnic group, um, but it, I do think it's the case that we should have, as was mentioned at the beginning um, of today, that we should have a, a Congress that looks like the people for whom it comes. Um, and that goes not just for people of color, but for uh, women and people of different ages and people of different socioeconomic statuses. Um, and uh, the way to do that would through the Fair Representation Act, and so that's um, my uh, interest in this. Thank you, Ruth. I was trying to see if I can pull up. I was, is that, no, no, no. Up, hello, <laughs> hi. There is, this one is working, yeah. perfect. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Um, I was trying to see if I could, if, if, if Zoom had some permissions issue regarding other hosts, so, yeah, yeah. I'm not giving my computer permission to see my screen, so I'm thinking if you guys want to hang up, you can just keep going. All right, great. Um, George? Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Okay, uh, right, so uh, I guess this is kind of a um, Disciples of Lonnie Guineer introduction. Uh, I too uh, trace my uh, roots to uh, this issue to Lonnie, uh, so it's really kind of humbling to kind of follow in her footsteps. Um, she uh, is a great thinker and leader, and uh, has really um, kind of broadened a lot of people's horizons. Uh, my parents uh, were immigrants from Hong Kong, so they grew up under colonial government, so they did not have any way to uh, participate in the political process. Uh, so when they moved here first to Canada, I was born in Canada, uh, and then eventually to the US, I really took the whole civics class really seriously because you know uh, a lot of my um, classmates, uh, they all uh, largely were citizens, and so uh, thinking about one day I would naturalize and you know schoolhouse rock 
videos uh, really got to me, um, that I would also uh, be able to participate in a way that my parents could not, because they always complained about being second-class citizens. The other thing that was really instrumental for me was my first job out of college was as a fair housing investigator for the state of Rhode Island. And so it was both really inspiring uh, on one level uh, to feel like I was standing on the shoulders of giants who had given their blood, sweat, tears, and lives to pass uh, landmark civil rights legislation. And so thinking about uh, segregation, uh, the ideals behind the Fair Housing Act, uh, and how, frankly, a lot of um, urban segregation has been largely crafted by federal public policy. Um, and at the same time, thinking about the Voting Rights Act, and as Ruth mentioned, uh, in terms of the analysis that Lonnie Guineer really delved deeply into, it requires segregation to create these so-called majority minority districts. And so how can we move forward with two major pieces of landmark um, civil rights legislation that in many ways are in conflict with one another? Uh, and so for me, as someone who sees the systemic racism that is perpetuated by segregation, like that to me is something that we have to address. Uh, it's imperative. It was largely created, once again, by federal public policy, and we need to address it. But we are not talking about it at all. Uh, we say a lot about racial equity, but we're not talking about how we deal with segregation. And therefore, we also have to um, critique our electoral systems. They cannot be based on segregation. Thinking about my experience as an Asian American activist, we do not have the same history of segregation that uh, African American communities and to uh, maybe a slightly lesser extent uh, Latinx communities have experienced. There's just no protections uh, unless you live in like Hawaii or parts of California or maybe New York. That's it. We don't uh, exist in the same concentrations that other communities of color exist in. So in that way, uh, it made me think, wow, we really need to think outside the box. And then once I started thinking, wow, uh, getting outside of American exceptionalism, well, there's actually lots of countries who do something uh, like what we're talking about. So it made me feel like mm, we can learn from other places. Um, so we, we have a couple, a few questions, and also would like, inc encourage you to think about a question that you want to ask of this panel. Um, at some point uh, in the next 15, 20 minutes, we'll be collecting those, but you can pass them earlier if you'd like. Um, so we should start by highlighting one of the main components of the Fair Representation Act, uh, the use of multi-member districts. Uh, these are larger districts that elect more than one candidate in the earliest early 20th century, we saw a rise in the use of multi-member districts in combination with proportional voting systems. Uh, of course, later, winner-take-all multi-winner districts that didn't use proportional uh, voting methods uh, were challenged under the Federal Voting Rights Act. Could you speak to the historical use of multi-member districts and respond to concerns that multi-member districts lead to the dilution of the voting strength of protected groups? Is that a me first question? Um, uh, we can, Ruth, yeah, we can go. Yeah, That's let's, fine. yeah. Go ahead, Josh. Okay, I'll go. Uh, so my, the, the title to this part is called Back to the Future. Uh, I'm way too young to have seen that movie uh, in its first release. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, so we talk, uh, strangely enough, about uh, New York City, ranked choice voting. It's new, it's great, however, it happened in 1936. Uh, this is, once again, as um, Lee uh, and Neil talked about, part of the legacy of the reform, the, the progressive movement. Um, so the people who brought us um, child labor laws and suffrage uh, also thought deeply about challenges of governance at the city level and saw in a lot of big cities uh, rampant cronyism and corruption uh, in the form of these uh, democratic machines. Uh, and the kind of number one target was uh, Tammany Hall in New York City. And so in 1936, uh, the progressive movement activists uh, with a lot of other civic leaders were able to pass proportional representation um, in essentially a very similar form to what's being proposed under the uh, Fair Representation Act. So essentially, how did, how did it work? Each borough was assigned a certain number of city council members based on their population. So let's say uh, Manhattan got three or f three to four or five. I don't. Remember. I think the numbers change depending on the, the timing. 
you would rank your candidates uh, in order of your preference, uh, and then you would do as uh, Pedro has, had uh, articulated. You would start counting them, the first place votes, and then you would transfer them depending on uh, if someone passed that threshold or you would then eliminate the bottom vote getter, all of that you probably know about. Uh, what happened? Uh, so before, um, when uh, there were single member districts, the Tammany Hall machine was able to just manipulate those maps like crazy, and with about 60% of the vote, they won almost 100% of seats. Under the proportional representation system, they still continued to maintain roughly 60% of the votes, 60% uh, of the vote share. They got about 60% of, of the seats. Uh, who won those other seats? Well, uh, interestingly, a bunch of minor parties, so-called minor parties, other parties, not the Democrats or the Republicans. Uh, you had an American Labor Party being represented, a fusion party, and interestingly, the American Communist Party uh, consistently elected someone. Uh, the first people of color got elected. Uh, Adam Clayton Powell was the first uh, African American that was elected to uh, New York City Council under proportional representation. Uh, later on, there was uh, a member of the American Communist Party who's also African American who was elected, as well as the first woman uh, elected to City Council. So all of these glass ceilings were completely shattered uh, because uh, the machine was just unable to manipulate it to make sure that only their candidates could win. So as it relates to the critique of multi-member districts, oh my gosh, that's so scary. Well, it depends, uh, it's like the uh, devil's in the details. There's something called block voting, where if you have like three winners and you get three choices only, it still is a way that the majority can pretty much wipe out uh, the minority from uh, getting any seats at all. So yes, multi-member districts in and of itself isn't the solution. It's really proportional representation that has the uh, promise and the benefit of making sure that if you're not 50 plus one, you still get a, uh, a fair proportion or an equitable share of, of, of votes. Right, and we've seen other forms of you know, semi-proportional, proportional systems uh, be used at the state level. I think, Ruth, you, you wanted to talk and highlight that. Yeah, yeah. so um, in Illinois, for like 100 years, they used cumulative voting with multi-member districts. It was only repealed in 1982. Um, and it was more in response to issues you know, related to political corruption, which it turns out were not solved. Um, by changing the system um, in Illinois. So there are plenty of people, you know, alive and voting uh, who use cumulative voting throughout um, their lives to elect um, the state legislature in Illinois. And uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, given what George and I have been telling you, it turned out you get many more people of color elected um, to the state legislature over the entire time um, that Illinois used the cumulative voting system. You know, we are talking about times when you had you know, in the South, certainly zero representation, you know, zero people of color um, in state legislatures, uh, partly because of the electoral system and partly because of complete vote denial. Um, but in Illinois, you have people um, of color all the way through, you know, since 1900. Um, and uh, it's also, um, there are lots of other places where it's been used more recently, but Pedro, I think we're going to talk about that with voting rights litigation. Great. Ooh, questions. Um, I want to ask this other question about uh, the Voting Rights Act aspects um, and alternative voting systems generally. Um, historically, we have associated um, single member districts as a remedy to Voting Rights Act uh, litigation. Semi-proportional systems such as limited and cumulative voting were also used in the Dillard line of voting rights cases. Uh, recently, we've seen the use of ranked choice voting in multi-member districts reemerge in the VR world. Um, we've seen first in East Point, Michigan, and in Lowell, Massachusetts, as part of an acceptable set of remedies. And now we see ranked choice voting being uh, used under state VRAs, um, such as Palm Desert and Yakima. Um, explain what you think leads to the consideration of ranked choice voting in, the, in both the federal and the state uh, voting rights litigation um, in, you know, how, do, how should we think about uh, the State Voting Rights Acts as well in, in this context? Yeah, can I jump in first? Yes. Um, so the, um, the, we talked, both the George and I, about um, the issues of segregation and integration, right? So that's one reason why ranked choice voting just makes more sense um, to enfranchise communities of color. But say you are like Yakima the city, where they got 
sued by the ACLU under the Federal Voting Rights Act. And to be sued successfully, they had to be able to show they could draw a single member district for the Latino community. It still is the case that Bragg Street voting would have worked better there, because as long as you have potentially multiple candidates who want to run, and you use first past the post, then you split the vote. And so that actually happened in Yakima. You ended up with multiple candidates running who were the choice of the Latino community. And so the plurality of white blocs that voted together were able to get their candidate elected. And then this multiplies as you talk about the case of multiple coalitions working together. So black and Latino and Asian communities. And then when we think of other types of representation, age, socioeconomic status, and so on. So to me, that's a reason. Even if under the Federal Act you can draw a district, you may not want that as your remedy. I guess the other reason, as well as the segregation issue and the coalition issue, is that populations change over time. And I know we're coming up to a redistricting next year, because the census is on this year. But in five, six, seven years' time, there are going to be communities where you have vastly different populations. But still, if you're using a system that was drawn up five, six, seven years ago, then you haven't kept up with the times. If you just have multi-member districts, or just entirely at large, so in a city or a county, with ranked choice voting, then it doesn't matter how your population grows or shrinks. You will continue to be able to represent people in some level of proportion to their population. So yeah, that's why I think it's a great remedy in voting rights act cases. And this is also why, in Washington, the Voting Rights Act was written to explicitly allow for the fact of things like ranked choice voting and remedies. And more recently, we saw in Oregon a state voting rights act that was passed initially with respect only to school boards and education board groups. But in both of those cases, ranked choice voting is more explicitly considered than in the California Voting Rights Act. And I just want to address one more thing, Pedro. You had talked about concerns from groups about the use of ranked choice voting. I know that MALDEF have often been opponents of using ranked choice voting with multi-member districts for the reason that if turnout is low amongst the Latino community, then you can't guarantee that people will be elected. You say, oh, you only need 25% of the community. Well, if you only have 25%, but your turnout rate is a lot lower than, say, the white or black community, then I can understand why that would be worrying. But that's why I think that we can't just turn up and be like, you know, I'm a litigator. That's a piece of litigation. I'll just finish it and move on. You need to actually engage in community, which is why I work with people like George, you know, who works with communities to try to make more full civic participation change rather than just, you know, changing an electoral system here or there. And that's actually something that Lonnie Winnie talked about in one of her early articles. I love the Lonnie love here. George, do you have any thoughts about consideration of ranked choice voting in the state and federal context? Yeah, I'm going to focus more on the state context and riff off of what Ruth talked about. So there is the Federal Voting Rights Act. We've talked about that. What we haven't talked explicitly about is the State Voting Rights Act. California really passing the first one about a decade ago, which overall, in many ways, kind of mimics the Federal Voting Rights Act, is more accessible to be able to challenge inequitable electoral systems, and just doesn't cost as much, because federal litigation could be upwards of a million plus for a fairly straightforward case. And so the intention is to provide state-level protections that are more accessible. California is an interesting example, because it provides what's called a safe harbor provision for single-member districts. So basically, if you are a jurisdiction, you're getting sued, and you move to single-member districts, done. Problem solved. Is it? Maybe, maybe not. And so from that experience, fast forward a little bit. In my two jobs ago, I directed an organization that promoted civic engagement in underrepresented communities in Washington State. And so we did a scan of Washington to see where were the biggest problems with regard to civic engagement, voter participation, and descriptive representation. And we definitely, our eyes drew quickly to central Washington, where we have a large farm worker population, similar to the Central Valley in California, that were becoming 40, 50, 60% of the population, and were just completely shut out of power. And so at first, the obvious solution is just 
throw money at a voter registration drive and turn those folks out. And then we thought, hmm, uh, if there are systems where we do all of that really well and still we cannot overcome it, we need to start thinking about changing those systems itself. Uh, and so that's why um, advocates and myself started to think about, well, we could challenge under the Federal Voting Rights Act. There had never been a Federal Voting Rights Act case, and we started to do that work. We essentially ran a campaign uh, for the city of Yakima uh, to switch to single member districts, even though we knew that it wasn't the be all and end all, but it was at least simple to understand, because in the end, we needed proof that, we're, that there were racially polarized voting patterns. So we ran it thinking that we would lose ahead. We lost. Surprisingly, we didn't lose by that much. We lost 45 to 55, which actually mimics the percentage of uh, people of color in the city. Uh, and that, so that led to the um, Federal Voting Rights Act case that then, as Ruth mentioned, dismantled that system. At the same time, it started to get us thinking, uh, working with uh, um, a lot of uh, different voting rights experts uh, about passing something similar to California. And so as we started to have this discussion, we started to try to figure out how we could include language that was explicitly permissive of ranked choice voting and proportional representation, and in the end, just landed on, let's just be agnostic about it. Uh, it's controversial because folks didn't really know uh, what that really meant. Uh, election administrators were kind of freaking out because they're like, what are you talking about? Um, so in the end, uh, largely, we believe that as the advocates, as long as it doesn't say anything, anything is permissible. So that's how we ended up landing on the legislation that passed, uh, that because of this kind of slight small controversy that could have created a problem, we ended up being able to pass the Washington Voting Rights Act, which, as Ruth talked about, uh, has led to some uh, significant movement uh, around proportional representation as a potential remedy. It's fascinating. Um, I'm gonna do another call for questions in case people um, had any additional, or you know, now have a question. Uh, please pass those, uh, someone will go around and collect those. Um, you know, as experts and people who work directly uh, with folks on the ground on trying to improve local democracy, um, you know, now that we've heard uh, about the historical use of multi-member districts, their past, uh, their state context and local context as well, and, you know, context of uh, block voting as well, um, and also hearing about alternative voting systems in Voting Rights Act litigation. We mentioned cumulative voting, which is also a remedy, uh, limited voting, and now ranked choice voting. Um, there's also a long history of voting rights cases that has led to the creation of electoral opportunities through single member districts, which is the standard remedy, right? One debate among voting rights groups and reformers, and uh, Ruth, you talked about a little bit about this, um, there's a question whether or not RCV uh, can deliver on its promise of representative democracy on a larger scale. Uh, what lessons learned from our experience with multi-member districts, um, and what are the lessons learned from our experience with multi-member districts, and what do they tell us about their application at the congressional level? Was that a me first thing? I think, I think that's a you first. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so, there is this hidden history of proportional representation, uh, particularly in New York City, as well as the Midwest, uh, where, frankly, the reason why it was repealed, largely, uh, was because a proportional representation was successful in opening up representation to communities of color, uh, to voices that were not represented by the two major parties. Uh, and so the people who had power, who thought, eh, whatever, we can figure it out, we'll still be able to dominate, when they couldn't manipulate the maps and they couldn't get all of their candidates selected, that's when they turned their backs to it, uh, the knives came out, and this just led to uh, this um, surge of reaction against it and repeals uh, to uh, proportional representation. Uh, so for me, one thing that is a lesson learned is that it was very successful, so please do take that message. The other thing is that once we get what we're looking for, we have to stay for the long term to defend it. So that's incredibly important. I think that the other piece of this is uh, just thinking big picture. I, I feel like sometimes in the voting rights world we get very uh, granular in terms of the remedy for this situation under which conditions, which is best, but to think bigger picture, and I'm gonna go back to what Lee brought up uh, about a multi-party system. Because I think uh, as uh, a person of color activist who's been thinking about uh, empowerment and how do we move things like 
um, uh, reparations policy, uh, like besides, uh, besides what um, uh, Tanahasi Coates has been pushed out, like there hasn't really been real discussion about how do we uh, address the past. Uh, not even like a South African style Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's kind of like a de dead on arrival issue, uh, but still fundamentally impacts every one of us uh, to this day. Uh, and so I think a lot about the history of people of color led political parties, uh, that we also have this hidden history of like the La Raza Unida party in the uh, Southwest, uh, that for 20, 30, 40 years, uh, regularly elected uh, city council members uh, that were just kind of defiantly like not the Democratic Party because, you know, the Democratic Party in the South, the Dixiecrats, these are uh, a very racist party that had no interest in empowering um, people of color. Uh, and so if we kind of just take a step back in terms of not the kind of uh, bits and pieces of this remedy versus that remedy, uh, is the two-party system in fact robust? for people of color, for advancing real racial equity? I think the answer is no, uh, and therefore we need to, f uh, if form should follow function, we really need to really think about moving to a multi-party system whereby potentially a pro-racial equity party could emerge, uh, and once again, once you have um, three, four, five parties, then there's room for negotiation. Then something like reparations or dealing with segregation starts to become something that could be on the table as real public policy. <laughs> Thank you, George. Ruth, do you have I any thoughts? Have <laughs> <laughs> uh, my my uh, sort of other interest with respect to Congress is all the kind of spent litigating cuts and gerrymandering claims. Um, you know, Lee and Neil were talking about how it's not the most efficient system to try to get rid of partisan gerrymandering through litigation. Um, and I would agree, it's taken me years to get the Supreme Court to say we're not doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, that we can still go through state courts, there are still ways. Um, and then also, you know, um, the other thing I've been doing has been trying to get independent redistricting commissions adopted. And they, I do have a great promise, but all of the places that I work in to get um, the commissions adopted in 2018 are all facing um, challenges to try to repeal them or undermine them or redo a ballot initiative. Um, you know, the, it, the struggle just goes on and on. And so I'm going to keep fighting for them because it's something that is gettable and doable. Uh, but if we were able to have a better representation act, your ability to gerrymander just goes down hugely if you have more time districts. Exactly how Neil mentioned um, in Maryland, right? If you're, if you're drawing one line, um, you know, rather than lots and lots of lines, it is just harder to gerrymander, um, harder to predict out exactly how that district will go um, over the next... Uh, 10 years and also smaller groups within that community are going to be able to elect their candidates of choice. So we will see you know, parties like um, George talked about that care about more specific issues. Um, and, and ultimately then, again, Lee talked about this, you, you just get better alignment with voter preferences. So many people are in states where the, more than half the state, it doesn't even have to be more, but more than half the state believe one thing and the legislature doesn't do anything about it. And that goes you know, in a left and a right direction. Um, and that, doesn't feel democratic to me either. Um, so the hope would be that you know if you can if you can do this at once. Like yes, it is a bit of a lift. I think Neil was right to say um, you can't just assume that this is a you know a piece of cake. Um, it's not that difficult to fill out you know three bu bu bullets rather than rather than just one. Or in Australia, I used to use a pen of no not a pen but a pencil and paper and write one two three four five. Um, it, it's not that hard, but you need to you know have people accept and understand how it works um, and, and buy into it. Um, but once you do, and you see the results immediately, it's not a thing where you have to wait such a long time. Um, so it would be wonderful. I would love for it to happen. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Um, I'll, I, have a, I have a set of questions, and I think this one's uh, an interesting one, and I think one that we should engage with. Um, in 1948, there were two black members of Congress. Today, there are 55 members of, uh, of the Black Caucus. Uh, Supermajority districts were seen as the only way to get minority members of Congress. Is there any evidence from current voting behavior that supermajority districts are less necessary? L are they less necessary? Go ahead. Yeah, well, so... Um if you mean less necessary, as in if you just did at large voting like they used to, to do, like no, racial polarization of voting is still high. So if you have less than a majority um, of, a, of a city, let's see, I'm right, 40% um, minority, um, but in, in 
voting age citizen voting age population um, if you if you do just add lunch voting voting is polarized and that is the case for many places across the country but it doesn't mean that the district system is the only solution right so the, you, you, can, you can draw districts and the, the black community perhaps unfortunately is incredibly segregated and so um, these districts tend to work because you can draw districts around them uh, uh, around the black communities in many places across the country and hence you can get a big progression of black caucus um, but is that the only system no right i mean you could still get um uh, african-americans elected to congress and candidates of choice for the african-american community elected um, if you were using also member districts um, and the other thing that we've essentially shown um i don't know how i mean money we did talk about this again back in the early 90s like this view that um well, let's have single member districts and, and help get um, candidates of choice of the black community elected and then maybe along the way racial polarization voting will go down. That second part, I mean, nobody sort of could back it up. It was just like, well, let's just hope then, you know, we get some more people elected and everyone realizes life is great. There's a little bit of evidence that if you have a mayor of a city who's a person of color, that that can have some reduction on the amount of um, polarization. So white people are like, oh, look, yeah, there's a, a mayor of color and they're doing just fine, right? It can re reduce um, polarized, racial polarized voting a little bit. Um, but in terms of uh, congressional representatives, state representatives, you know, boards, um, there is no evidence that it reduces polarization. Um, and so, you know, do we have to do single member districts? Uh, no, right? We, we did them because that made sense and people, that's all people knew at the time, but um, you don't have to. I also would like to add to that and say that um, there are a lot of cases, and I think uh, the, the Ferguson uh, school district case is one of them, um, that had a finding that essentially that the voter turnout uh, for the African American community and the non African American uh, voting bloc um, were reaching near parity, meaning that they were almost high enough that that the adoption of a single member district plan um, wouldn't capture the way that the population growths are evolving in that jurisdiction. Uh, in that perhaps something like cumulative voting would be a better way for the African American community, which is an at large, you know, an at large election system, which is AKA multi member <laughs> district, um, that that would afford perhaps better uh, electoral opportunities. I think another thing that I think is important to consider, uh, on a, and I'm, I think about this at the local level, is that in these vote dilution cases for uh, African-American voters, you know, right now we're nine years from the census, from the last census, and we're gonna be 10 years, right? <laughs> and we're gonna be having a new census count. Um, for African-American voters, it's a lot harder to figure out um, what demographics look like um, based on surnames. Like for Latinos, you know, my last name's Hernandez. I mean, I think you can figure out by precinct in the voter roll, like how many of us are registered voters, how many of us turn out. For African American voters, when the, you know, when these cases are brought much years after the census, it's harder to capture and know what that representation is at the local level. Uh, and there's just evidence. I mean, there are ways and researchers and experts that can provide great guesses. But I do think that, um, you know, African American vote, vote, I think it has been the trend that they tend to be, have higher turnout uh, compared to Latino voters, uh, compared to API voters as well. Sure. Anyway. Um, also, can I jump in, Pedro, on that? Yeah. Um, Again, my old home, the city of Chicago, um, has a declining black population. And so for the city council, which has 50 districts um, with a city population of about 2.7 million people, um, it, it is possible that over a decade, if you keep seeing declines in population, that you won't have majority black districts, even though they started out that way, um, which is a problem that is unique in some places um, for the African-American community because we don't see as much reducing population um, in the Latino and API community. Unless you have things like Hurricane Katrina and then everything, you know, a whole area completely changes. Um, where again, you would probably want to do a redistrict turnout for that because the, the population is so different. And, and the way that um, pop cities are growing or not growing, I think, is interesting as well. Um, when you, in George, perhaps you can touch on this. Uh, I feel like, and I think the research points to that housing segregation is generally getting worse 
but the way it's getting worse, it's not necessarily by uh, huge compact sections of cities uh, that you can neatly carve out single member districts out of. In fact, it's becoming uh, much more clustered into enclaves and communities where different communities rotate in and out of them. So if you have a bunch of clusters in a city all spread out in a town, capturing the single member district uh, uh, representation opportunities for some of these groups is gonna be a lot more difficult. I was actually uh, thinking, we've talked enough about this, is there other questions that we should Oh yeah. To? <laughs> uh, someone asked, um, the national media, generally speaking, focuses on the parties and the presidency as opposed to the down ballot where fair rep, uh, the Fair Representation Act would help. How do we uh, make the Fair Representation Act get noticed by more national media? I don't know if I have the answer to that. <laughs> I think today is the start of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I agree. Yeah. Well, I do think that uh, things have a way of um, sometimes bubbling up. Uh, and so the, Ru the work that Ruth and I have been thinking about uh, at the local level, um, thinking about the legacy of the uh, progressive movement and you know, for maybe 10 to 20 years time, there was just a lot of movement towards reform. I feel like we can kind of recapture some of that momentum uh, where there are the similar challenges at the municipal level where people are at least giving lip service to racial equity. Uh, and if we press them to say, okay, what does that actually mean in terms of political representation? Can we draw single member districts that really uh, are equitable in terms of representation? Uh, I, I, I think about some of the work uh, that's done by the city club in Portland. Uh, Portland, Oregon, it's a fairly, uh, not super diverse city, um, and for the communities of color that live there, they're not segregated. Uh, and so they came out with a report that basically said, is our all at large voting system equitable? They have a history of uh, electing maybe just uh, less than a half a dozen uh, people of color ever uh, to their city uh, commission. It's a commission form of government. Uh, and they explicitly said, no, this is not going to work. We cannot draw single member districts. That remedy is just off the table. So in the end, they recommended some shift to proportional representation. So I think that nowadays, given that uh, at least we have some awareness that racial equity is a thing that we should talk about, if we can make the connection and actually uh, make it concrete, like what does racial equity mean within a context of political representation, I think we will largely not default to a single winner districts. I think that, uh, Ruth, did you have any thoughts? Or any other which is one which was that at least um, this is not a case where there's sort of a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, everybody gets that it's broken. They don't think just the presidency is broken. They think that all politics is. So at least there's that entree. Um, the question then is, well, how do we fix it? Um, and, and, and so th there's at least the ability to open the conversation. Um, but as I think Neil and Wendy said earlier, I mean, it's confusing to explain to people, but it's, it's possible. Um, I, I think we have time for one more question. And this is, I think, an interesting one. Um, can you name some states that are considering multi-member districts? And would it be harder for the voters to wrap their heads around multi-member districts than RCV? I feel like I, I, I would like to respond first and say that um, uh, multi-member districts with RCV, well, I mean, we've talked a lot about multi-member districts. If you don't have a of uh, an election system that accommodates uh, uh, more voters being represented, um, then, then it creates a set of problems when you have racially polarized voting. It creates a possible Voting Rights Act violation. Um, that said, you know, there are some bills that have floated the idea of having multi-member districts with RCV. I think New Jersey just had a bill introduced again this year. Um, George and Ruth, did you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think Ruth has talked a lot about the over 100 year history of Illinois, so uh, that is not a kind of um, flash in the pan. It was something that was, uh, uh, that voters supported when given the choice to reject it a couple of times. So there is a really robust history. You know, I I'll go out on a limb a little bit. Uh, and, you know, as I've been 
brainstorming with other advocates, like how do we get to this idea of multi-member districts because people automatically go to, what, you want three times the number of legislators? That's crazy, we're, <laughs> we're so anti blah, 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 blah. Uh, and so uh, one thing that uh, we're considering is what if we started the, also the conversation with um, proportional representation uh, with going to unicameral state legislatures. Because the idea behind state senates is we're just mimicking the federal U uh, US Senate, and that's a certainly an equitable chamber because <laughs> everyone gets an equal share of representation there, right? No, no. And so if we start the conversation about, you know, why do we have state senates? We're not getting a different type of representation as we do federally, which is a, its own separate problem. Uh, but why don't we just keep the same number of legislators, combine them into one chamber, uh, move to multi-member districts so it's not a, as radical of a change. We can s keep the same number uh, and that way uh, don't have to address the issue of like, oh my gosh, we're gonna have three number, uh, all these like uh, mouths to feed with uh, more legislators. That's something that people don't like. The, the Nebraska model, well, to a certain extent, but th that was based off model statutes that uh, during the progressive era of reforms that actually included proportional representation. However, upon the adoption of uh, of the model statute, so oftentimes we saw proportional representation being left out of that, which became a problem. But I, I love the idea. Any other, any other thoughts or quick questions? I, I think we should wrap this one up. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us remotely, Ruth. It's so thank great you, to Ruth. see you. <laughs> and thanks so much for being here, George. <laughs>